In this video, we're going to learn about conditional probabilities and the multiplication law. So here we've got a situation in which two fair dice are rolled. And given that the first die lands on a 1, what is the probability that the sum of the dice is greater than 3? Here we've got a really helpful table drawn. We've got values of the first die, values of the second die, and for each pair of values of the first die and the second die, we've got a sum of their values. For example, a first die is 2, second die is 3, then their sum is 5. Alright, so first of all, we want to compute the probability given that the first die lands on a 1. So that means we're limiting our space of possibilities here. We're only considering those possibilities in which the first die lands on a 1. So it's really just this first column here that we should be looking at. So let's go ahead and shade that in so we can focus on it. And then within this first column, we want to ask, what is the probability that the sum of the dice is greater than three? So let's go ahead and circle those instances. Um, here the sum is two, so nope. Here the sum is three, so nope. But here the sum is four, that's greater than three. And then above that, the sum is five, that's greater than three. Above that, six, above that, seven, those are all greater than three. So these are all the outcomes in favor, sums of 4, 5, 6, 7. So the probability is the number of outcomes in favor, that's 1, 2, 3, 4 outcomes, over the total number of outcomes we're considering. And the total number of outcomes we're considering was just that first column of outcomes, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So 4 out of 6 is our probability. We can simplify that to just 2 thirds. So there we go, there's our probability, it's two thirds. All right, so that wasn't too bad. This problem was relatively straightforward because we were able to count up all the possibilities here. But we can't always do that. Sometimes we're just given probabilities in a situation. So let's learn another method to frame the problem that will work when all we have is probabilities. So here's the way we can compute conditional probabilities using just probability. We write the probability of some event A given another event B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. Let's rewrite that in the context of this problem. So probability of A given B, so A will just be the event that the sum of the dice is greater than three. So let's write sum greater than three. And this needs to be given that the first die lands on one. So that line there means given, and then event B will be first die equals one. All right, so that probability, according to our formula here, it's equal to the probability that the sum is greater than 3 and the first die equals 1 divided by the probability that the first die equals 1. All right, so let's go ahead and simplify this. So we'll have our fraction, and each of these probabilities will itself be a fraction. Each of these will be fractions something out of the total number of possibilities, and there's 36 possibilities in total. So something out of 36, something out of 36. Why don't we compute the bottom probability first, because that looks a little bit simpler. What's the probability that the first die equals one? So out of these 36 outcomes, how many outcomes have the first die being one? Well, that's just this column here, one, two, three, four, five, six outcomes. And then let's compute the top probability. What's the probability that the sum is greater than three and the first die is one? So out of these 36 possible outcomes, how many outcomes have the sum greater than three and the first die is equal to one? Well, for first die to be equal to one, we have to be in this first column here. And then the sum is greater than three, for four, five, six, seven, those outcomes. So altogether, that's four outcomes. So four out of 36. And we can go ahead and simplify this nested fraction 
by multiplying top and bottom by 36. Just multiply by 36 over 36. And then we just get 4 over 6, which simplifies to 2 thirds. So either way, we get the same result, 2 thirds. All right, so now let's do some problems where we can't actually count up all the possibilities and we just have probabilities and we need to compute conditional probabilities based on that. First of all, given that probability of A and B is 0.5 and probability of B is 0.7, what is the probability of A given B? Well, using our formula, the probability of A given B is equal to the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. Now we can just substitute the given information into this formula. We're told that probability of A and B is 0 0.5 and the probability of B is 0 0.7. So 0 0.5 over 0 0.7, we can simplify this fraction by multiplying top and bottom by 10 over 10. That'll get rid of the decimal. So 0 0.5 times 10 is just 5, and then 0 0.7 times 10 is just 7. So there we go, 5 sevenths. On to the next problem. Given that probability of x given y is 0 0.5 and probability of y is 0 0.4, what is the probability of x and y? Well, let's just go ahead and start with our formula. The probability of x given y is equal to the probability of x and y divided by the probability of y. But this time, we're not solving for the conditional probability of x given y. We already know that's 0.5. We're solving for the probability of x and y. So let's rearrange this formula to get probability of x and y on its own side. Really, the only problem is this is being divided by probability of y. So to get probability of x and y alone, all we have to do is multiply by probability of y. So we'll go ahead and do that. Let's write this again. So we'll have probability of x given y, and then we're multiplying by probability of y, and then that's equal to probability of x given y. Let's just flip that around to make it very explicit. So probability of x and y is equal to probability of x given y times probability of y. Probability of x given y, we already know that's 0 0.5. And then probability of y, we already know that's 0 0.4. So really, we just need to multiply these together, 0 0.5 times 0 0.4. Um, 0 0.5 is like a half, and then a half of 0 0.4 is just 0 0.2. So there we go. That is the probability of x and y. Now before we go on, let's highlight one thing. What we started with here was the formula for conditional probability, but we were able to rearrange that into another kind of slick equation here. This equation here is known as the multiplication law because it tells us that the probability of x and y is equal to the probability of x given y multiplied by probability of y. Keep this multiplication law in mind so that we can just begin with it in the future instead of having to rederive it every single time. Here's another problem, more of an applied problem this time. So the probability of your car sliding at a particular intersection when it snows is 0.3. The probability of snow tomorrow is 0.7. What is the probability that your car will slide at the intersection tomorrow? So we wish to calculate the probability 
of sliding. Let's just call that probability of slide. All right, and what do we know from the problem? Well, we know two things. First of all, we know that the probability of your car sliding at a particular intersection when it snows is 0 0.3. So probability of slide given snow is equal to 0.3. And then we also know that the probability of snow tomorrow is 0.7. So probability of snow is equal to 0.7. So we can go ahead and set up the multiplication law for this situation. The multiplication law states that the probability of slide is equal to the probability of slide given snow times the probability of snow. And we know that probability of slide given snow is 0 0.3 and probability of snow is 0 0.7. So all we have to do is multiply them together. So let's think 3 times 7 is 21 and then we have to shift the decimal place back two times. 1, 2, 0 0.21. So there we go. That is the probability of sliding at the intersection tomorrow. All right, so lastly, why is the formula that probability of A given B is equal to probability of A and B divided by probability of B even true in the first place? We've just been assuming that it works up until now, but let's actually see why it works. Why don't we go ahead and translate this probability into just plain old English. So probability of A given B that's really just the probability of A happening given that B has already happened. Now think of this Venn diagram here with the events A and B as circles. Think of that as a dartboard. And imagine that we're throwing darts at this dartboard. So the question that we really need to ask is, given that we hit region B with our dart, What is the probability that we hit region A as well? Well, that's just this following ratio. It's given that we hit region B, so out of all that area, of region B, we are hitting some bit of area of region A within region B. All right, so let's actually translate this fraction back into probability language. So first of all, the area of region B, the denominator of this fraction, well, the area of region B right here is just the probability of B. If this whole rectangle has area one, then the area of B has to be probability of B. And now the area of region A within region B, that is just the overlap here. It's all this area over here. And that is, of course, just the probability of A and B. So there we go. There is our formula.
So now we know how to compute conditional probabilities and use the multiplication law to compute the probability of the intersection of two events. In the future, we'll continue to learn more about the multiplication law, including how it simplifies for independent events.